What's going on everybody? My name is Bart Comart. Welcome back to the channel. In this episode, we're gonna be building a modern shed from start to finish, and we'll cover everything from concrete, framing, siding, roofing, and everything else in between. So there's a lot of material to cover, so let's dive right in. Welcome to the Comart Project. This video is sponsored by Wondrium. Your brain is gonna love this place. All right guys, so last year we bought our dream house and out back there was a kid's playhouse that my kids didn't want to play in. So to utilize what we already have, I'm gonna start framing our shed underneath it. Now I know this sounds weird, but this allows me to utilize the six by six support posts as a building block. Later in this video, I'm gonna be moving the shed to a concrete pad that we're gonna pour, but for now, let's just frame the floor as if it's a deck and then work our way up. So I cleared out the brush, put down a weed barrier, and I can start securing the two by eights that will make up the outside ledger of the shed floor to the main posts utilizing framing nails. Once I have the outside established, I use the speed square to lay out the location of my joist 16 inches on center and then cut them to size. Because I'm working alone on this, I screwed a two x six to the bottom of the ledger on one side to act as a second set of pants. This is gonna allow me to sit the joist on top of it while I nail it to the other side. Obviously the location of the shed is temporary, but at this point I didn't know how long it was gonna be before I had to move it. So I put in some blocking at the corners to carry the weight and then reinforce them with some lag screws. Next, I can start installing the joist hangers, and each joist hanger is gonna have what's called a speed prong on it. And it's basically like a little hook that can be hammered in into your ledger, and it will hold the hanger in place while the rest of the nails are hammered in. And it's very important to actually use all the holes that are provided in that joist hanger, because that is what's gonna carry the load of that joist. Now that I have the base all framed up, I can put in the floor, which is a three quarter inch treated plywood. Then with a jigsaw, I can cut out the slats for around the posts and nail the plywood with three inch framing nails. Then I can stagger the rest of the sheets, leaving them long on one side. And with a circular saw, I can then trim the access. When framing walls, most of the time, it's easier to put the wall together on the ground and then stand it up and nail it to the floor. But because I had all the cross members of the clubhouse to work around, I decided that it would be easier to install them individually. So there was a lot of cutting, checking, and recutting, but it's definitely something you wanna get right because this is the foundation for everything going forward. If the framing is off, the window installation is gonna be difficult. The siding will not line up, right? So taking some extra time here will make everything moving forward that much smoother. Next, I started putting together the header for the door opening. I used a piece of half inch plywood sandwiched between a couple of two by sixes with a lot of construction glue and nails. This is gonna give me a large opening and transfer all the overhead weight from the rest of the shed. All right, now we can move on to installing the half inch plywood sheeting, which was pretty straightforward for me since the height of the shed is eight foot. I was able to just put a full sheet up to it and nail it into place with the framing nails. And when working on an exterior project like this, make sure that you guys are using hot dip galvanized nails rated for exterior use. Even though in the end, everything is going to be watertight, I'm still nailing into pressure treated lumber and regular nails will start to corrode after about two years in pressure treated. So it's pretty important to use the right fasteners for exterior and pressure treated work. Next, I can install the house wrap around the entire shed and put down a rubber membrane on the base of the window sill. If a leak is going to occur, it's most likely gonna be in an opening like a window or a door. So taking the time to install the flashing properly and using plenty of silicone will ensure that the window stays nice and dry. Next, I can start working on the temporary doors. And because I got something really cool in mind for the actual doors down the road, I just need something that works in the meantime. So a couple of two by fours and a sheet of plywood will work fine for now. With the doors installed, I can start laying out the concrete slab that the shed is going to sit on. I first screwed together a couple of battens from scrap lumber so that I can move my string back and forth to get it squared up. Then I outlined the pad with spray paint and started digging down. 
There's a few tools that you can rent or buy that will actually cut the grass out for you, but since I needed to go down about six inches, a shovel worked for me. Once the grass was all removed, I could start prepping the ground by watering it and running a plate compactor over it. This will help pack the ground and get it ready for gravel and concrete. And if you guys want more detail on how to pour concrete or anything else in this video, check out the individual videos in the Shed Build series in the description below. And because research and online learning can be an extremely valuable and sometimes necessary resource when taking on a project like this, I partner with Wondrium, the sponsor of this video. Wondrum is an online learning platform with hundreds of series to choose from taught by experts in their field to further your skill set. And I'm not just talking about basic school subjects. You want to learn more about beer? How about robotics? Or even how to decorate a cake like a pro? Wondrum's got you covered. Whether you're on the couch, on vacation, or you're in your car listening to a podcast, there's a course for everyone. I personally have been taking Woodworking Essentials, Benches and Boxes by Mike Siemens, a seven part course that takes you through making a simple box with dovetails, which I've never done before. So whether you're new to a hobby or just want to perfect a skill, Wondrium's got a course to walk you through it. And because you guys are so awesome, Wondrium is offering a free 14 day trial by clicking the link in the description below so you guys can see for yourself and get the most knowledge for your buck. Thank you Wondrum for supporting what I do and now let's get back to the build. Alright so now that we have a poured slab we can finally move the shed to its final location. And to do this I first need to disconnect the clubhouse from the rest of the structure by removing a few bolts and cutting away the stairs so that I can pull up with the forklift and lift it up. And you might be asking yourself why I didn't just build the shed on the pad in the first place which would make more sense, right? But when we moved into this house, we needed a shed ASAP because I took over the garage as my shop. And this was the quickest alternative for me. So fast forward a couple of months and Honey Bunny tells me that we are getting a pool place right where the shed is and it needed to get moved. At first, I thought it was gonna be a huge pain in the butt, but then I thought to myself that if I'm moving this shed, I might as well redesign the entire thing and improve on it. And that is where I came up with the idea for the carport. After the shed was in its final resting place, I could start working on framing out the roof line for the carport. This requires a large beam that will span 10 feet out from the shed, and notching the post will allow me to just sit it on top of it instead of relying on fasteners to hold the weight. Next I can start working on installing the 4x4 post that will actually carry the weight of the beam. I first drilled a 5 8 inch hole in the concrete and used a wedge anchor to secure the post base bracket in place. After setting the 4x4 I attached a beam to post bracket to the top. This will allow me to sit the beam on top of the post and have something to secure it with. Now that we have the back roof line all situated, I could start working on framing the front side of the shed. This consists of a knee wall with window openings and a large beam above it to carry the load of the rafters. And let me tell you guys, this was way heavier than I thought. And there was no way that I can get this thing set in place alone. So I enlisted the help of Honey Bunny and we were able to shimmy it up and secure it to the front wall using lag bolts. Next I installed the front post which was 10 feet tall and I ended up using a makeshift ladder system to lift the beam one side at a time until it sat on top of the post. It was a little difficult getting it up there but where there's a will there's a way and now we are ready to start working on the rafters. I'm using 2x6 lumber for this and the trick for cutting any kind of rafter is making sure that they're all the same size. So cutting the first one and using it as a template for every other one after that will make sure that the roof line is nice and consistent. Because if you were to cut one, trace it to the next one and then use that one to trace the next, 
Any tiny error you might have made along the way will just compound all the way through. And by the time you get to the end of the roof, nothing's gonna fit anymore. Now, you may have a wall that walks on you a little bit in or out, but you can always modify the back bird's mouth a bit to accommodate that. But to be safe, I use the same template for all the rafters and I double check the cuts every second or third rafter. That way I can modify things as needed before nailing them in place. With the rafters in place, I can start sheathing the roof with half inch OSB plywood. And luckily for me, the roof on the backside is fairly low. So I was able to attach a couple of four x four posts to my neighbor's fence and use that as a platform to get the sheets where I can actually grab them and lift them up. Once on top of the roof, I secured the first row with inch and a half decking screws and I only put 304 screws in. This is just enough to hold the sheet in place for now because when working on the roof, moving sheets around and cutting them, I just feel safer without an air hose that I can trip over in my way. And I even screw down the plywood temporarily to the roof when making my cuts because with all the sawdust that the saw makes, it's very easy for that sheet to slip off the roof and take you with it. So now I have all of my staggered sheets screwed down, I can come back with a nail gun and nail all of them to the rafters. And just like with the shed floor, I leave them a bit long on one side so that I can use a palm rotter with a flush trim bit and get it perfectly flush to the rafter. All right, to start waterproofing this roof, we're gonna put down a synthetic membrane. And this one, you wanna start at the lowest point of your roof and overlap them going upwards. You kinda wanna lay it like, like a shingle, but in long rolls. And then we can secure it with some plastic cap nails. I chose a synthetic membrane because at this point, I didn't know when I would have the time to install the metal roofing. And a traditional felt underlayment can dry out or leach oils within a couple of hours of being exposed to the heat. But a synthetic membrane can sit up on top of the roof for as long as it takes me to get the metal installed. Wow, it's windy! Holy shit. Look at my ah! And I'm standing on the ladder. Yikes, man, what a day to be out on a roof. All right, it's time to put on the fascia and I'm going with a one by six that's treated because it was cheaper. Yes, it was actually cheaper than regular pine. I'll take it, I'll take it. And there is a very easy trick to put up a fascia by yourself, little L-shaped contraption. And what we're gonna do is screw this to the underside of the joist and then I can rust my fascia on here and not worry about you know, it falling off. Next, I can install the aluminum flashing that will protect the fascia. Now I know this is not your traditional way of doing things, but the large lip on the drip edge will allow me to later install wood paneling on the soffit and it will protect it from the rain. I used galvanized roofing nails every eight to 10 inches to secure the flashing to the fascia and wherever there was a seam, I put down a color matching silicone before overlapping the next piece. Next came a strip of flat flashing, and this is because the top drip edge I'm about to install was not large enough to reach the bottom one. So I needed something to make up that empty space. And luckily for me, I had a roll left over from when we trimmed out our windows on the house. Next, I put in the top drip edge, and you can see here how it overlaps the piece of flat flashing. And with a bit of silicone, I can slide it in under the previous piece and secure it with roofing nails. Finally, I can start installing the metal roofing panels. And I was very eager and excited to get them in place because this would mean that the roof is waterproof and I can start putting some tools into the shed. So I laid my first row in a straight line, making sure that the bottom edge overlaps the drip edge by about an inch and a half to allow for water to run off. 
Then for the second row, I made sure I applied plenty of silicone on the panel ridge before putting down the next sheet. To make screwing the panels to the roof a bit easier, I first used an awl to punch holes through it before securing the panels using number 14 by 1 inch screws with a rubber washer. And when installing these screws, you don't want to over tighten them. You want to crank that screw just enough for that washer to mushroom out a bit, creating a watertight seal. On the gable end, I installed a piece of treated 1 by to support the gable flashing. Then I can put down the gable flashing over the edge and drive screws every 10 to 12 inches into the flange on top of the roof. And on the fascia, I made sure that I spaced the screws evenly every 10 inches because you're going to be able to see that from the ground. And finally, to finish off the roof, I installed the peak flashing the same way as I did all the others and secured it to the ridge of the panels, making this roof complete and watertight. With the roof done, I can now tackle installing the windows. And instead of paying a ridiculous amount for custom windows, I'm going to be making my own out of polycarbonate. First, I nailed trim pieces to the back side of the window opening and used black spray paint to paint all of them to match the rest of the shed. And with these trim pieces, I made two of each one because I'm going to need one on the back side to prop the window up against and then the same trim piece on the front side to lock that window in. Polycarbonate is basically plexiglass. It's what they use to board up windows for hurricanes and it's supposed to be shatterproof. Plus, it cuts great with a saw and is fairly inexpensive. I think I paid $175 for a 4x8 sheet, which was enough for all 9 windows on the shed. So the installation for these windows is fairly simple. I just placed some silicone on the backside trim piece, popped my polycarbonate piece in, and then added more silicone on the front and tacked in the front trim piece with a couple of brad nails. I think this was my favorite part of the build, peeling off the plastic, revealing the window, and knowing that I didn't have to spend a fortune on custom windows. Now, I don't know how they're going to hold up over the years, but for a shed, I'm super pleased with how they came out. With the windows in, I can move on to installing the board and batten siding. But first, I needed to put down a Z flashing strip that will let the water drip off the bottom. After painting it to match, I cut a corner relief and placed the strip on the lip of the floor and nailed it using galvanized nails. Then using sheathing tape, I secured it to the house wrap and it's time for siding. To save on the budget, I'm going to be making my own siding out of 3.8 CDX plywood that I ripped to 16 inch pieces for the board section and a 1x6 that I ripped to an inch and a half for the battens. I first marked a level line where I'm going to be installing a trim 1x8 around the window. Then I can cut the panels to size using my circular saw and attach them to the shed with galvanized nails. I used this scrap piece of polycarbonate as a spacer between all the panels. With board and batten siding, all the pieces are nailed to the shed and are not nailed to each other. This is to allow movement as the seasons change. So the space between the panels is essential for the nail that holds the battens. This is going to make a lot more sense when we actually go to install those battens. All right, so that was the last piece. And before I start putting on the battens, I want to actually get some primer and paint on it because right now it's completely open and I could just roll on top of it and not worry about anything except for two windows. So it's going to make life a lot easier if I just paint it now and then throw out them battens. So let's do it. Because I'm going with a darker color for the shed called Inkwell, I had my local paint store tint the primer. This is going to allow me to have good coverage without having to put down a lot of coats. I don't know guys, I don't know if I like this color. Contrast between the bottom and the top. It's as if the two colors are blending in. It's driving me crazy right now. Stella, what do you think? She 
Oh, I think this might be it. That's definitely it. This color is called Iron Ore, and as soon as I saw it, I knew it was gonna be perfect for this project. So I painted all the battens with it, and for the top trim piece, I went with a color called Black Magic. This color is not a super deep black, but it's perfect for the contrast I got between the iron ore. After installing it around all the windows, I could move on to the battens, first installing all the horizontal pieces and the border around the door. Then I put in the vertical battens, making sure I place my nail right in the middle of that piece. This is what I was talking about earlier with allowing the boards to move. By placing the nail in the middle, they can move independently of each other. With that part of the siding done, I can move on to installing the accent corner of the shed. And again, I'm going to be making my own out of some ash lumber I had milled up. Now, I'm not going to get into great detail on this part of the installation because I'm going to be releasing a full tutorial on it very soon. So if you're watching this video a week or two after its release date, there's a link in the description below that will take you to that video. So there's a lot of ways of installing shiplap siding and how it's made will decide the process most of the time. I put in rabbits on my panels that were the same size on the top as they were on the bottom. So I had to put something in between them to create the reveal. And I had some CR123 watch batteries laying around that worked perfectly. With the accent corner all finished up, it was time to put on the steel barn doors I had made and install the adjustable door glides. And with that, I can call this project done. So there you go guys, we got the shed and it is finished after four months of working on it by myself. There are a few things that I still need to touch up on it, like the underside of the carport, a locking mechanism for the doors, but other than that, I'm pretty happy with where it is. We can store some lawn equipment, the kids' bikes, and even some of my materials that I'm not using right now, and not have to worry about it getting wet. This was a super fun project for me, and if you guys have any questions on how I built it or why I did some of the things I did, please leave those down below in the comments section below, and I'll answer them as best as I can. And if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing, hitting the bell notification, because we're about to embark on a massive renovation of the entire house, and I wouldn't want you guys to miss that content. Thank you so much for joining me on this experience. I'll see you guys next time.